morning. Good morning. I like it. I like having this a live audience. Let's let's be. I'm I'm a soccer coach, so I'll be cheesy. Let's do it again. I want to hear it again. Good morning. Good morning. That's what I like. If only my seven-year-olds were as responsive. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Today is October 13th. This is the uh, October edition, 2022, of our second Wednesday safety session brought to you by Milwaukee. I want to thank everyone for being with us uh, this beautiful morning. Um, I want to get the day off started, as always, with some gratitude to those people that allow us to bring you our second Wednesday safety session. Number one, the team from Styles. Thank you very much, Styles, for allowing us to be in your offices today and to broadcast live from uh, the 10th floor of the main. So it's a great place in here, here in downtown Fort Lauderdale. I'm excited to be here. I also want to make sure that I thank the team from Kelly Cronenberg. We have the great Cedric Alexander on the other side of the camera, uh, making sure that everything on the technology side works well. Uh, that's how old I am. I call it the technology side. I also want to thank Safe Right Solutions. If you all were here, you'd be able to have some beautiful breakfast, courtesy of our friends at Safe Right Solutions. Thank you, Catherine and team. Um, and I also want to make sure that I thank our, uh, am I forgetting anybody? I just, just double checking. I also want to make sure I thank our title sponsors, uh, Milwaukee Tools. And today from Milwaukee Tools, we're going to be welcoming a new member of the team. Well, he's not a new member of their team, but he's new to us. This is his first second Wednesday safety session. So Mr. J. Fonseca. Turn on that camera and say hello to the audience. Floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good, good. You guys got me good. I'm going to try to match uh, Carlos's energy here. Um, I don't think I had enough coffee yet. Uh, with that being said, um, I'm going to kick this thing off. Oh, you got me on the big screen. Nice. I'm going to kick this thing off. I'm going to share my screen, guys. Um, again, I appreciate the, the opportunity to be in front of you guys. Uh, my name is Jay Fonseca. I am the new safety specialist for the Southeast region. Uh, for those of you that have worked with Curtis uh, Douglas before, uh, I am his backfill. So I've known Curtis for a long time. So I'm hoping uh, to replicate what he's done and uh, kind of take it to the next level. Um, with that being said, I'm super excited to talk to you guys today uh, about one of the newest products that we have in our line that we're extremely excited about, and that, that is our, our safety helmets. So uh, with that being said, let me share my screen here on the technology side, as Carlos says, and uh, get this thing going. Let's see here. You guys just give me a, 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 a yeah, if, it's, if we're going, we're good. You guys see my screen pretty good? Yeah, you're good. Perfect, perfect. All right, guys, as I mentioned, uh, safety helmets is something that we, we've we uh, we've just launched that we're extremely excited about. Um, I'll go over this real high level. Uh, I don't want to take too much of you guys' time up. Jumping right into it, we all know the importance of uh, stuff being made stateside. You know, so we made a huge investment as Milwaukee as a whole uh, in a facility to, to not only make our products in-house, but moving forward, a lot of our hand tools, uh, PPE solutions are going to be made in the States, which, which is a great thing, right, for creates more jobs. Other than that, you know, it gives us a little bit more uh, control over the quality that of the products that we're putting out. And obviously, we're able to revamp products and get to the market a lot quicker. So that's, that's, a, bit, that's a big benefit that you guys will be seeing out in the field, uh, out on your, on your job sites, and, and a lot, hopefully a lot of new products from Milwaukee uh, moving forward. So looking at, uh, at, at safety helmets, we're going to offer them initially in, in four types, uh, front brim or no brim. And then class E or, or class C, um, I'll go a little bit more detail on what exactly those mean uh, on the next slide here. So overall, uh, typically what you guys see on, on, a, on a job site are, are type one hard hats. Type one hard hats have been around forever. Uh, they're the most common. Um, but what, what we, we, we notice is a, a type one helmet only protects you from impact on the top of the head. It's got to be directly on top. So if you if you think of a job site, the odds of something hitting you directly on top of your head are pretty slim. Um, there's always, uh, ish, uh, I guess, risk of side impact, uh, corner impact, front impact. So that's where type two is getting a lot of traction, um, especially in other markets. We're seeing type two kind of kind of picking up a lot of steam and a lot of contractors going towards that. So what type two does, it protects you not only from the top, but from all sides and the back of your head as well. So it's, it's really a, a next step in, in protection. Kind of go over the, the different types. Uh, we got class E, which is uh, unvented. Um, again, just more geared to those electricians. 
Class C, which is uh, which is vented, uh, is more what you're going to see on job sites for your GCs, uh, things like that. Uh, a lot more breathable, especially being in the Florida market, uh, is really good at uh, at this dissipating heat. And they kind of give you a little bit of background on, on where all these standards and uh, and claims came from. Typically, before uh, Milwaukee came along, everyone would kind of claim to the EN 12492 clauses. And what those are, little European standards that aren't really geared towards safety products. It's more of a, a, a mountaineer type helmet. Um, so what that does is it does offer protection. So what we did is not only did we adhere to those standards of, uh, of absorption and retention, we also are anti type two uh, rated. So we cover, we cover both, we check both boxes uh, to make sure that we're putting out some of the most uh, obviously innovative products on the market. So when Milwaukee looks at a product, we see what's out there and we try to take it to the next level, right? So what we saw is, is guys needing better protection. So obviously we, we came in with side impact. We've seen a lot of contractors uh, super gluing, duct taping, um, using ratchet straps to, to mount uh, items to their head. So we have, we have all, our heart, all our helmets, come with what we call a, a bolt accessory slots. So we're gonna be able to, uh, to come in and offer uh, uh, headlamps, earmuffs, uh, sunshades that all clamp into the to the helmet, so the helmet is essentially a uh, a tool belt on your head, so you can add more items. Uh, the suspensions uh, that we see out there were a little bit mundane, a little bit uh, uh, archaic as far as features, and and we're not really geared towards hot job sites. So what we did is we offered a lot of padding in our in our in our uh, in our in our helmets, and uh, we made it where they're moisture wicking, where they actually stay a lot cooler. Um, and really quickly on my next, I'm going to show you a video of a, a little side-by-side -side of, of, of Milwaukee with one of the leading competitors uh, currently in the market. So standard five-by-five five, uh, foot drop here. Kind of sort of some of the absorption classes that we, we test in our, in our facilities. Cool. Real high level. So this little slide here is, again, it's one of our just we call it a one slider kind of has everything I have. I, I just talked about summarized. Right. Better protection, more comfort. Both systems you see it comes with the, with the headlamp mount. Uh, that's universal. Fits any headlamp. Because of the pen holder. Obviously, we're going to come out with a lot more uh, boat uh, accessories as far as like sunshades, uh, earmuffs, things like that. Made in the USA, as I, as I mentioned earlier. We, uh, we know that a lot of contractors don't use just white uh, helmets. So we are going to launch with seven initial colors, and then we're also going to have the, capa uh, the capacity to, to color match. If uh, one of these colors doesn't uh, fit your, uh, your standards and you need something a little different, we can look at that as well. And on the last slide here, just kind of what I talked about before, right? Really exciting stuff with our, with our boat accessories. Um, the ability to add items to your helmet or hard hat um, out the gate. So this is something that we launched. These products will be coming out. This is like a little sneak peek here. Uh, we're looking at April 22 timeframe. Um, but again, really excited to uh, to present this to you guys, let you guys know what's what's new and, and what's exciting with Milwaukee. Um, please reach out to uh, to myself. I'll give, uh, I was Carlos on my contact or Roger. If you guys see a need for any of, the, of these items, if you have any, if uh, you know you guys have any need for upgrading some of your, your head protection or want us to come out and just talk PPE with you guys. Obviously, we have a full line of uh, uh, PPE solutions. We'd be more than happy to partner with you guys. Um, Jay, throw that. out your email real quick. Throw out your email for everybody. Yeah, my email is going to be uh, Juan, J-U-A-N, uh, period, Fonseca, that's F-O-N-S-E-C-A, at milwaukeetool.com. Yep, and you can send that Florida State helmet to my office. Oh, Florida State. We'll work, we'll work on that. We'll work on that one. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jane. Welcome to your first Second Wednesday Safety Session, man. We look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, man. By the way, that's a great segue. Before we get to our presenter, I just want to make sure I hit you guys up with some great information on our upcoming events. Next month's Second Wednesday Safety Session is going to be focused on mental health on the construction site and on suicide prevention. I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but the suicide rates in the construction industry are extremely high. Um, and I think not many people are aware of, the, uh, of, the, of that rate. So we're going to bring some awareness to that. We're going to give you guys some tips and tools for dealing with it on the job site. 
Um, that's going to be November. Our December second Wednesday safety session will be our um, will be our OSHA presentation. It's going to be the state of OSHA. So we'll have Condell Eastman here to discuss what's going on with OSHA. A lot of changes going on there um, this year with the new administration coming in and a lot of information that we all need to be aware of. So we'd like to hear what's going on directly from Condell himself. Um, and then the last item, I wanna make sure you all are aware of actually two more items. Safety related, our uh, safety fair is coming back. It is probably going to be on Saturday, January 22nd. I'll have confirmation of the date by the end of next week. Um, and that's fantastic. We weren't able to do it last year because of the pandemic. Last time we had it, we trained over 200 people and gave out about 500, 400 certificates of training. So yeah, it's, it's a huge feat. And a lot of the folks that come out and that we train, our goal is to train those folks that aren't going to have anywhere to turn for safety training. So, you know, it's up to us to help provide them with a safer environment to work in um, and the tools that they need to stay safe. So that's going to be January 22nd. We're always looking for volunteers for instruction. So if it's something you'd like to do, just reach out to myself or one of the members of our safety committee. Uh, last but not least, our golf tournament, our annual golf tournament presented by American Global is October 29th. We're going to be returning to Trump National Doral. It is a beautiful property. It's a fantastic golf course. And best of all, we have three, three bars on the course. Mm -hmm. So you guys can, if you're a terrible golfer, then I hope you're a good drinker. So it's going to be October 29th. You can find information on that on our website, sfagc.org. So thank you very much for that. That being said, today's topic is welding, cutting, and brazing safety on the job site. Uh, today's presenter comes to us from a fantastic South Florida AGC member firm, Steel Fabricators. Mr. Mel Luases is the safety manager at Steel Fab, and he has over 20 years of experience in the safety arena. Mel's gonna be covering what safety directors and managers need to know about protection of personnel, fire prevention and protection, and confined spaces. We are very grateful to have Mel with us today. He even showed up really early, which makes me excited. So Mr. Luasas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Very excited to be my first presentation. Hopefully I do well enough so I can have more opportunities. Um, <laughs> we'll see. One second, one second. Let me share that screen. All right, so we're going to be talking about the ANSI C9549-2021 uh, standard. We're going to talk about the first session or the first section, which is the general aspects of the of the standard. We're not going to get into the, the, the details on, of uh, the uh, gases and, and other materials that are needed. So um, before we start, let's see, clicker is not working. Give me one second, please. Let's try this again. I put new batteries here. Let's not give it a shot. Nope. We just tested like five minutes ago. We did. And it worked. So the battery there. Give it a try again. Nope. Bear with us, folks. This is what happens with live TV. <laughs> no problem. I think we should be okay. And I think I have the solution. One more try, Mel. There you go. Thank you. All Sorry right. about Thank that. Thank you. Folks. That's okay. So. I also wanted to thank the sponsors of this uh, presentation. I like that's in Fort Lauderdale. So, that's okay. Because you're here. All right. So, and we lost it. Did we? There seems yeah. to be, I'll tell you what, I will go ahead and click for you, sir. All right, it's going to be a lot of clicking. 
It's fine. All right, let's go to the next one. So it's not a clicker. Oh, there you go. The topic we're going to be talking about in this section is going to be nothing. Preparation for the work area, personal protective equipment, ventilation, fire prevention and protection, and confined space. Those are the topics that we're going to be talking about today. And of course, safety first is always in our mind. One of the one of the concepts that I found about safety is the condition of being protected from danger, risk of injury. It's very simple, very compact uh, definition. But I say I think it says everything that you need to know about safety first. And we're going to talk about this a little bit at the end of the presentation. So preparation for the work area. We have different scenarios. We have plant scenarios and we have work site scenarios. Okay, for the plant, they recommend. Go ahead, you got it. The layout, where the material is going to come in, how the material is going to go out. Why is this important? Because we need to know how we're going to manage the process, where we're going to be doing the welding, how it's going to be processed, how it's going to be managed, how the material is going to be handled. Next one. Go ahead. The layout, the work area. We're going to have the booths. We're going to have the welding equipment where it's going to be set up depending on that material that we say is going to be coming in, where the tools are going to be set for the welders to work. Our sources, gas lines, how everything is going to be prepared. If it's something that is we're planning to establish a, a, a layout for a plan, or is a plan that is already in place. I, I can't hear him speaking. That one's up and this one. Yep. Carlos, I, I can't hear I can't hear the presentation. I can hear the speaker. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is an example. When we plan, sometimes we, we have when we are in a job site, we plan everything that we need to do, but we need to collaborate with each other. In this uh, plan example, we have people working here and we have another worker here that is affected. They prepare, they have all the, all the setup perfectly set, but it may affect another person, may affect another, co another company, may affect another contractor. So that is why it's so important work with a job hazard analysis, not only for us, but for the rest of the contractors. Uh, for the field preparation of the area, one of the first thing is the access for the work area, how the, how the uh, employees or the workers are gonna get to that work area. What is going to be the access? They're going to need barricades. They're going to need uh, uh, to handle some of the materials. Um, 
the hoses, the cables, where the generator is going to be, where the welding machines are going to be, where the gases are going to be. So that's part of the planning at the beginning. As and also as they move, uh, how is that going to be processed? How is going to be managed in a way that is, again is not going to interrupt with the contractor? Is not going to interrupt with the same work that they're doing. Next. The tools and the welding supply is the same thing, similar to the plan, but here's gonna be probably more, more movement. How they're, gonna, how they're gonna go if they're working in a, in a tall building, how they're gonna be moving, the material is gonna be bad, is it gonna be forward, is it gonna be cranes? You need a system for somebody else to bring the material. You're gonna use carts, you're gonna use uh, uh, any, other side, any other kind of equipment that is gonna be needed to bring those materials where they're gonna be stored while uh, they're working the job site. The fort, the seas, or any area lift, where they're going to be located, how they're going to be um, placed in the space in correlation with other, with other contractors. What, what kind of reach, what kind of special features you need in an area lift to reach the, to the places where you need to perform welding, welding uh, uh, tasks. The position of the cranes and the reach as well. For protection, the kind of harnesses, lanyards, and yoyos that you're going to use. For the, for the personnel, okay? All of that goes in the planning. It cannot be like at the moment that they get, okay, I have all my equipment in my truck, I'm good to go. It has to be planned from the beginning. Where are you <coughs> gonna use it? How are you gonna use it? Ventilation, you're gonna have confined spaces. You're gonna have any, any uh, work with the, with the gases and fumes that are gonna be a problem. How are you gonna plan for that? May not be a specific confined space, but, gonna, but it's gonna be a place where you don't have enough ventilation. And then you have to be prepared to deal with that. What kind of equipment you're going to need to deal with the gases and fumes. We're going to talk about that in a little bit when we walk uh, through the ventilation section. And of course, the qualifications, the training, and the experience that we have with the welders or with other kind of, of uh, employee that's going to be working on the site. It's important to know how far they can go, who have the experience to do what kind of, what kind of task, where you're going to when are, where are you going to put your more experienced people? The, the, the people have more experience, more knowledge on, on um, fog protection. The people have more experience working with um, specific uh, materials, specific uh, alloys. How they're going to handle that? Some additional precautions also we're going to take is the inspection for equipment and the maintenance. That has to be also prepared beforehand. What kind of equipment I have? Is, it, is the equipment working perfectly? I don't have any, any problem with equipment. We have a problem with equipment previously. What kind of maintenance has been done? Is uh, we have uh, personnel authorized or qualified to the to the inspections and the and the uh, repairs? Do we need to have a vendor to come and and, and perform the the, uh, the repairs in case we need it? Do we have an extra equipment to replace a backup equipment if something fails? So we don't fall behind in the project. When we will encoded materials or reflective surfaces, how that's going to affect also the employees? If they are if they are welding is reflecting on a surface, how it's going to affect the employee that's performing the welding or another employees that are in the surrounding areas? Are we going to require hot work permits? Is the GC is going to require hot work permits? Is it going to be every day? Is it going to be valid for a week? Is it going to be valid for just uh, the task at hand? What kind of requirements are going to be uh, required um, asked on that uh, hardware permit? We're going to have to think about some hazards that are not visible at first hand. So in conspicuous, uh, in, in conspicuous hazards that we may find. When I, I'm going to show you uh, an image about that, the weather. How we plan with the weather, what kind of, especially here in South Florida in summertime, how that weather can affect the work that we're going to be doing, how that's going to impact, how we're going to prepare for that to deal with any delays that, they, that may cause. The body system, depending on the kind of task that we're performing, who's going to be doing what, we can make sure that the company person or the foreman or the superintendent knows where everybody's gonna be. You can use radio systems, you can do checkups, 
or you can use the body system when you have two people working in the same area. So if something happened to one of the employees, the other one can alert the rest of the team if you need uh, to require uh, emergency services or use first aid or any kind of help that they may need. So to the additional fire hazards, something we cannot recognize. Let me zoom in a little bit on this, in this picture. What we see here is a job site when they were removing some, some beams and some material that was around. In this case, they were uh, torching uh, an angle that was in this, in this area. They didn't notice this little hole here. In some of the other beams that holes were covered or plugged, this one, it wasn't, it wasn't clear, it wasn't not. And some of the slack fell through that little hole. It happened that that hole was an old conduit for, for a lighting in that beam. And it went to a, to a room below the welding area and ended up burning a room in that area. So that's why we had to be aware of any little details, anything that can happen. We have to keep our eyes open. If we have drawings of when we're working in, in a project that is like a remodeling something, you know, where are the little details that can cause something like that? Next up is personal protective equipment. Before we go into the details of personal protective equipment, let's remind a little bit about the hair care controls. First, always we're gonna go through elimination. We're gonna to try to eliminate the risk that is uh, present in the work area. Can we totally eliminate that, get rid of it? If we can, can we substitute the equipment or, or uh, the situation that is occurring that can cause harm or, or injury? If not, we can apply, can, apply, can we apply engineering controls? Can we modify the area? Can we modify the equipment? Can we modify the type of job to reduce the risk of injury? If that doesn't work, then we go to administrative controls we put in place rules and procedures to eliminate the risk. For instance, we are in, in, a, in a confined space. Instead of working eight hours, we're gonna have teams working two hours at a time, something like that. If nothing of that is able to control the whole risk, then we go to PP, which is the last line of defense. So welding, lenses, uh, welding helmets, is the first thing, of course, that we're gonna be using. We have clothing, gloves, aprons, capes, and sleeves. The material property of these, of these capes or, or aprons is important. Any respiratory protective equipment that may, may be needed. So when we go into the helmet and filters, the filters is one of the main, main things that the welder is gonna be using, depending on the kind of welding, what kind of filter, how, how dense have the filter need to be to work with the kind of uh, task that they have at hand. Must be compliance with ANSI or ICA uh, 28, uh, CA 7.1. Also, uh, the shape can be selected by the, um, the standard of the uh, um, American Welding Society, F2.2. They have to be free of flaws or damage or anything that can obstruct the vision. Okay, you cannot have stickers, cannot have anything, have cracks or, or damage. Or, or, uh, or debris or anything, or the helmet itself that can um, block the vision of the welder. Of course, they have to be properly maintained and replaced when damaged. Um, we saw in the, in the presentation from Milwaukee, we saw some hard with duct tape and things like that. And sometimes the work is improvised. Make sure that we inspect the, the, the PPE that they use. It has to be in tough condition. It cannot be repaired, it cannot be fixed. PPE is not something that you fix, it's something that you replace. And of course, it has to be compatible with other kind of PPE. If they're gonna use respirators, they're gonna use uh, earmuffs. They have to be the flat ones that they can use under the helmet, okay, or the earplugs, whatever they need. All of this is something that needs to be plan in advance. So when you go to a job site, so you have everything coordinated. This is a, a picture an image of the, of the table that we uh, talk about from the American Welding Society. And then we have the different the helmets we have from the basic one we have for the most um, technological advanced with the, with the automatic shades and everything, okay? When we select PPE and when we talk about how we're gonna plan a job, it's very important to always keep the, the feedback from the welder, from the employee. We wanna plan for something, 
you know, they are the ones that are going to be doing the job. So it's very important to, to get the feedback. I gave you an example. I, I used to work in a, in a fabrication plant. I would start providing these helmets for the guys. And we have a guy, a Russian crazy guy. And he used one of these. And his task was to tack the frames of a grate. And uh, basically what he did is just flip it on and off all the time. Flip it on, point the, 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 the gun and close it and tag it, okay? So we provide one of these within two hours. He said like, this doesn't work. The, 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 the reaction time of the, of, the, of the shape wasn't as fast as he could do it doing this, okay? So he preferred to use his. So it, getting the feedback is very important. Are you talking about automatics? Yes. That is, okay, we didn't say that. Okay. Oh, so yeah. Another thing that we noticed with the automatics is like uh, the almost all the almost the first model have batteries. The new ones just have the, the solar right. uh, uh, receptor that illuminate automatically. The problem with the with the battery ones is that when the battery starts to fade, they don't notice. They still see the click of the on the on the glass, but it's not protecting as much, and they were they were getting uh, flash marks anyway. So we changed to the solar one. All right. Clothing. Of course, must provide su sufficient coverage. It cannot be sleeves that are gonna be half the arm, okay? Or it's gonna be too short, it's gonna be too tight, okay? You have to provide the coverage that they're gonna need all the, all the parts of the body are gonna be affected by the welding, okay? Have to be durable. And of course, it's a given, flame resistant. Compatible with the task at hand. It's gonna be the type, the type of job that they're gonna be doing. It has to work for what they're gonna do. You have to be uh, able to allow mobility to the kind of job that they're going to be doing. Their colors are preferred to minimize, uh, minimize uh, reflection. And of course, have to be as comfortable as possible and the right size. I sort of got, I'm sorry. Well, it wasn't zero anyway. Sorry about that. So, as per section E4 of the standard, heavy materials such as leather or flame resistant clothing, which has been chemically treated to reduce the combustibility of inherent flame resistant refer lighter. He tends to call me all the time when I cannot pick up the phone. Um, so we just be chemi chemically treated to reduce combustibility of in in inherently, fl inherently flame resistant are preferred to lighter materials because of they are more um, difficult to ignite. Sometimes I see welders that use flannel shirts because they think it's thick and it's gonna protect them, but it's very fl flammable, you cannot use that, okay? So we have to be careful with that. Sometimes they wanna use their own things, you know, we have to be aware of that and plan and educate them about that. Some more properties, sparks may lodge in roll sleeves, pockets, clothing, of cuffs, anything where a spark can fall in. Um, is therefore recommended as lead on color skip button or a standard. Pants should be overlapped, uh, the shoe top to prevent spark to going into the shoes or the laces. Now, we have some welders that the smoke is, you know, all right. You can use the flickers and sometimes with the smoke. This kind of material or, or equipment or whatever you want to call it, matches, seatbelts, they are okay. The problem is gas lighters. What's the problem with that? It's compressed gas with the heat that can ignite, okay? And they can explode. There's plenty of videos on YouTube. You can see how this happened. We have that happen in our plan. Thankfully, he have it on the pocket of the, of the apron. Okay, he was just scared nothing happened because they have the leather. Well, since then we changed to providing matches to all the guys. So these are little things that we don't think of, but it's, it's good to know, you know? Jeez. Don't worry, Bill, we can edit it out. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right. So, coming back to this. 
We're going now to respiratory protective equipment. I got a question. Yes, sir. The, the lighter and the matches, is that really allowed per OSHA to be used when it's not OSHA, OSHA doesn't specify what kind of light you're going to use because OSHA doesn't talk about smoking in the, in the, in the, in the work environment. Okay, so OSHA is not going to tell you what you particularly can use or not. It's like if you have, what we did in this particular case was trying to prevent the same thing from happening. We eliminate the use of the, of the, of the lighter. Okay, the other thing you can promote is that you have in your, in your, in your uh, toolbox or whatever when you go into a break, you, you smoke, you have a comment on that? Yeah, I think what it is. You were referring to smoking, right? And he's referring to you're not supposed to use one of the big lighters to light your torch, right? right? Oh no, 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 no! I'm not talking. I'm talking. No, the light is not to 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 light the torch. No. Yeah. No, you, you use the you use the flicker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, no. Well they, the yeah, but well the smokers yeah. tend to do that. Yeah. No, we're talking about the smoking because they were keeping the the lighters under under. Yeah, you're right in the right. Yeah. Absolutely. Use the striker lighters. Exactly, exactly. Most of the striker, yeah. No, the no, the lighters. That's not what. Yeah. But again, okay. As I said before, that's what you need to know your people because you know they're gonna if they have the the the, the sepo or the matches or whatever they're gonna use it because you know the striker I left it over there, I left it in the toolbox, whatever I have in my hand, you know, on me that's what we're gonna use. Okay. The exposure levels. We need to know what kind of exposure is gonna be um in the work area and the limits okay in short exposure level is how much of the chemicals and material they're going to be exposed to and the limit is going to be for how long they're going to be exposed to those any assigned protection factors then we go once we know all these details then we can determine what kind of protection they're going to need from a simple mask to a full hood and a respirator Any additional information you can find in OSHA 1926-55 uh, or General Industry 1910 Super C. Noise control. As we said before, when possible, try to eliminate or reduce the, the source. If we have generators, maybe generators can be outside the work area, outside the, 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 the environment where they're gonna be working. Sometimes it can be in the truck outside um, or separate from the area where they were working. Make sure PPE is always available for employees and they know how to use it. Earplugs is one of the PPE that not always is used properly. If we don't train employees how to use it properly, you're gonna produce, put something like that, you know, whatever. I got an employee once, he wasn't too much fun of using the earplug. So what he used to do is cut them in half. So he can just put it like this. So everybody thought he was, you know, using it properly. So again, it's very important to know your people and how you train it properly. Nowadays, with technology and these new microscopic devices, okay, a lot of workers like to listen to your music, listen to a game, listen to, you know, whatever, okay, and they use earbuds. The problem with earbuds, of course, they're not PPE, okay? But the main problem with this is that they're distracting. There may be an emergency. Somebody's trying to let me know something's happening. I'm not going to hear. Even if they have this, no, I have only one ear. I can't hear from the other one. No, I totally discourage the use of earbuds on the workplace. So we go to ventilation. The configuration of the space. If I'm in a plant, I know how the flow is going to be, or can, how can I force the flows uh, of, of, of uh, air with equipment, fans, or extractors. The number and type of operation that can create contaminants. Okay, I can have a, a work environment like this. I can have three welders, or I may have five welders on each side and one row, three welders in the center. So depending on what I have, how it's going to be the distribution, I may need them, uh, to plan for the flow. Same thing in a, in a job site. I'm going to have one, one welder or here only, or I'm going to be, try to advance. I'm going to have five welders on the same area. So it's very important to know how that's going to work so we can calculate for the ventilation that in the space. Any concentration or any toxic material or flammable contaminants? 
the location of the welder in relation to those contaminants. Am I going to be in front of the, in front of the, the, the flow of air to take the contaminants away from me, or going to be facing the other side when the contaminants are going to be pushing all the, all the material, the wind is going to push all the contaminants into my face. Any natural air flow, which we have when we, when we uh, raise in a building, okay, which present the problem is that that air flow can change. So we need to be aware of that, how it can, uh, how it can change, how we educate the welders to be prepared to face that situation. So section E5 of the standard says fumes and gases. Yes, sir. Um, regarding the fumes, uh, are they heavy or light? Well, it depends on what you're- it's got, Everything is gonna be different. What it says here, fumes and gases from welding and cutting cannot be classified simply. It's too many variables, okay? So you need to, you need to review what kind of materials are gonna be welding, what kind of uh, uh, components are gonna be mixed, what kind of, uh, uh, how heavy is gonna be the composition of the, of, the, of, the, of the materials, the PEL, you know, everything. For each case is gonna be different. We're gonna talk a little, a little more. When we talk at the beginning about reflective materials, we're gonna talk also about uh, coating in the next slide. So the composition and quantity of fuel and gases depend upon the metal being worked, the process of consumption being used, coatings on the work such as paint, galvanized or plain contaminants in the atmosphere, such, such as halogenated hydrocarbon vapors from cleaning and degreasing activities. So as you see, there's many, many variables. It's very, very hard to say, okay, this is standard for this, this is standard for that, okay? So one of the things that says a good practice to reduce the generation of fumes and gases from paints and, prim and primer is to grind and sand the surface. However, that metal of removal may generate additional issues. So we need to make sure that if we're gonna do that, how we're gonna protect the worker from that. So there's not, there's not a, a simple answer for us. Every, every single thing is gonna be different. Uh, the different materials that we're gonna be uh, processing are gonna affect that, the fumes and gases as well. Again, goes with our job hazard analysis. So, you can require, or you, you may need to use breathing zone samplings. When you do a similar job, you have idea of what's gonna happen in this other job. So if you have the samplings uh, um, recorded, it can help you to plan, and then you can do more sampling at the, at the site to see if you're gonna need any more uh, modifications on the ventilation. As I said before, natural uh, ventilation which is the position of the welder. Mechanical ventilation, recirculators or cleaners. Low lovable limit materials, when you go with bearing, cadmium, uh, mercury, all these kind of materials, that's gonna affect also the kind of gases and your components you're gonna have. Fluorine compounds. Then another thing is gonna be the adjacent persons. I can plan everything, my ventilation, so my work area. When I'm working in a construction site, with all the contractors, the subcontractors. And I may prepare my ventilation going to be perfectly, and everything's gonna to go to that side where we have another team, another contractor working. So we have to be mindful of that. And that's why it's so important, the collaboration and the, and the weekly uh, safety meetings with the contractors to see how it's gonna be for each week, the plan that is for that week, how different contractors are gonna work and how it's gonna help plan for the ventilation on the welding activities. Confined spaces, of course, taking all the precautions for confined spaces, but what kind of ventilation we may need, what kind of respirators we may need for that particular confined space. Clean compounds, as I was said before, any uh, vapors that they can cause, how those vapors can mix with the fumes and gases that I have. Is there anything that's gonna be uh, turning to something more hazardous or more dangerous when I mix those? Our gas and cutting, in that case, the, reflect, the, the, the arc light, and of course, asbestos, if we have to work with that. For fire prevention and protection, what's gonna be the location of my work area? What kind of preventions, uh, a preventive measure I can have? Can I move the work area? This is gonna be probably more applicable to a planned situation because in a job site, you cannot just move these beams to weld it over here. Okay, but I can try to see if the hazards can be moved again with ventilation or um, planning. 
or protection of the work area. Combustible, any walls, any floors that may be combusted and working in, in a renovation space, let's say I have to work in this, in this uh, room and I have carpet, okay? So we need to be prepared for that. Outdoor permits, as I said before, uh, how are we gonna plan for that? What kind of requirements are gonna, are gonna be detailed? What kind of, um, who's gonna be the person responsible for that? Who's gonna be the inspector? Who's gonna be the supervisor responsible? Who's gonna be the authorized people to, to get in? Who's gonna be the uh, assistant outside the, the, the compliance space? Fire extinguishers and fire watches. Yes, sir. I have a question on outdoor permits. Is that more of like, like job site specific? It's gonna be it's gonna be more of a job site specific and and the and the specific uh, confined space that you have. So that's something that the contractor and the subcontractors are gonna be deciding at the moment. They say, okay, in this, we're gonna have this kind of confined space. We're gonna require some 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 uses are gonna require a hot permit, uh, like for every task. Some is as used for whatever you're gonna do during the day. So it's a specific for each one. So first thing, which is. It's a kind of tool that we always count on. Sometimes we forget to inspect them. Sometimes you go to the trucks. All oh, the trucks have fire extinguishers. Yeah, they have fire extinguishers. Well, the last time they were inspected two years ago. Okay, and then when you need it, it doesn't work. Okay. I'll give you an example. I happened to be many years ago. I used to work in mining and I had my fire extinguisher in the truck. Okay. Of course, when you work in mining, you know, there's a lot of vibration when you when you go through the, through the mine. <clears throat> I was coming home one day and I saw a guy, his car was catching fire. So I stopped, okay, I did my superhero thing and got my fire extinguisher straight up. <laughs> nothing, nothing, okay? So we ended up throwing that dirt and we put it up, but anyway. So I, I consult one of the guys, hey, you know, it's like, it's been like two months, three months, why didn't it work? <clears throat> His uh, comment was that, especially when you have fire extinguishers in vehicles, the vibration of the vehicle compact the powder inside. So he recommend they shake every now and then, hit it with a rubber mallet, uh, mallet, okay, every now and then to make sure, make sure they inspect, make sure that all the all the uh, components are okay. The needle is in the center, you know, they have the pin in position, and it's gonna be in working operation when you need it. Um, another thing is gonna be the proximity of combustible. Anything that's gonna be thirty five feet closer, okay, you're gonna have combustible. Have the, your fire watch. Have somebody dedicated you standing there with a, with a fire extinguisher. You need use the fire blankets, okay? Any openings that is closer to 35 feet, this opening not, don't, don't need to be big openings because when we see opening, we always are calculating well, something where I can fall through and that's for fall protection. But as you saw an example that I presented before, the little hole that was like probably an inch and a half was enough to create a, a, a fire and a, and a floor below. Any metal walls and pipes, you know? <clears throat> it's going to be conduction. If I'm welding something here and I'm welding metals, how it's going to affect on the other side of the wall? Do we have any um, flammable materials on the other side of that wall? Sprinkler systems. If we're working in, a, in an area where the sprinkler system is already set up, am I going to be too close to them that can, that can uh, trigger the, the, the sprinklers? Do I need to protect them? Okay. Same thing where we're moving material. You know, uh, more than once, so probably you have seen it or hear about it. When you're moving a 40 more material, more in a machine, and you have a sprinkler system, and then it triggers the whole the whole system. Containers again, as the uh, uh, American Weather Society F4.1, you can we can go to that stand. It's going to be more in detail what kind of protection you need for the uh, gas containers. Cheap work, and if, even though this is a little bit more dedicated to maritime, okay, but sometimes we're going to have places when we welding several sections of a, of a job that are very close together and we still can have um, transmission of heat by uh, convection. Conduction, I mean, I'm sorry. So for confined spaces, we talked about before ventilation in an open area, but for confined spaces is specifically critical. How we're gonna ventilate the area, how the work is gonna, that's gonna be inside, is gonna be breathing. How we're gonna get rid of all that, all that, um, uh, those elements, the quality and the quantity. That means continuous monitoring before, as we perform the job and afterwards. If we need blower fans, if we need respirators. They need to be planned from the beginning, not the day they're gonna do the job. It's like, oh, I think I'm gonna need a respirator. 
how the communication is going to go, what kind of uh, uh, um, communication they authorize people inside the, the confined space and the people outside the assistant are going to have. Okay, it's going to be visual, it's going to be pulling a, 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 a rope, it's going to be knocking on something, hitting something, okay, or just yelling. We need to plan for that kind of communication. The location of the equipment, again, depending. We also always try to see a confined space like something very little like pipe, but we can have a confined space that can be as big as a room, can be as big as a tank, okay? So we need to know where the equipment is going to be placed and how that equipment is going to affect also, because I can have a generator is going to be inside a confined space that are going to create also, if it's a diesel power um, generator, it's going to create gases too. And this is an example. This happened a couple of weeks ago um, in Italy. Four people died. <clears throat> uh, there's, there's this town in Italy, and they have like a yearly contest to see who makes the best wine in the town or something like that. And there's two gentlemen, 70 years old, 70 years old above 70 years old. Uh, one that was 50 something, was 60 something. So the first gentleman went to the room where they have the fermentation room. And they have to have specific ventilation conditions in those fermentation rooms because it creates uh, carbon dioxide. So apparently they didn't have enough ventilation. The first gentleman went inside, he fell down. Okay, the second one, another 70 years old, went inside, went to the floor. Then the other two tried to rescue them they went to the floor. A fifth lady went inside, but she fainted before she entered. That's the only one that survived. So confined spaces not only you find in, in work uh, situations. So that's why it's so important to plan ahead. They miss something, they probably were so worried about having the best wine. Unfortunately, they all died. All right. So another thing with confined spaces, the compressed gas cylinders and where the power sources are they going to be inside, they're going to be outside. Ventilation ducts. If you have the, the potential to collect uh, to, to place ventilation ducts, how they're going to be uh, placed in what area? Any cables, any other uh, additional equipment is going to be how they're going to affect the equipment that the welders already have in the in the confined space. Any working adjacent areas? Again, how's it going to affect? Okay, I may have a confined space that don't have enough ventilation. I may have another welding. Uh, job nearby, and those guys are being ventilated out of the area and may affect my confined space. Again, as I said before, it's, that's why it's so important, these meetings. I know sometimes there's a pain, you know, I, I'm working for both sides, go to this meeting and discuss, but that's why it's so important, because the safety of the workers is paramount. And if we don't, we don't plan ahead, then at the last minute is the worst time to try to figure out how to do things. Emergency and retrieval procedure, how are we going to get the people out? Who's going to be responsible to get people out? I'm going to have an equipment, I'm going to have harness, I'm going to have ropes to get people out. I'm going to have, like in this case, respirator to go inside and rescue the, the, the person that is inside of the persons that are inside. And as I said before, again, it's very important the location of the equipment, how it's going to be placed in the work area. All right. Now, in summary, we, 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 we saw several topics, but one of the most important things that we have, one of the most important tools that we have, we want to plan for, for a job site operation or in a plan operation, is going to be training. That's one of the most important things. Followed by training, okay, which is important. More training. Don't forget, some training. One other thing is going to be training. And the last thing, what do you think it's going to be? Training. training. No. Yeah. Enforcing safety rules. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right. Why training is so important, okay? The different topics that we talk about today. Training is important because it allows for better preparation for the work area, okay? Training is important because it educates workers to use the PPE properly. Training is important because it helps to understand the dilation requirements. Training is important because it equals effective, effective fire prevention and protection. And training is important because it can save life in confined space. That's, that's, the basic, that's the basic for everything, okay? And then once we have the training, right? And you have the documentation for the training, okay? So that's the first thing. I'm gonna prepare my team to do what they need to do. I'm gonna give them all the tools, the PPE, the equipment, and the training to use it, okay? 
Once I have all that, then I'm for a safety procedure because promote the safety job site. All right. Now that concludes the presentation, but I have one more thing. Okay. That I'm gonna I'm gonna use my, my soapbox here to talk about something else. Okay. We talk about safety first at the beginning of the presentation. And um, don't don't hate me for that, okay? What I'm gonna say, but safety shouldn't be first. I've been working for a while. Uh, uh, as, as, as was mentioned at the beginning, I've been working in safety more than 20, 20 something years. But I worked on the field for more than 34 years, okay? So I, I know both sides. Safety first is being beaten to death. We see it in slogans, we see it all over the place. Safety first, yeah, whatever, okay? Safety, the first documentation of the phrase safety first was in a magazine in 1873, I think it was, okay? Maybe we should change with the times. Maybe it should be hashtag safety strong or something like that. But why I say safety shouldn't be first, okay? You probably have seen the struggle if you're a contractor, you're a safety professional, okay? And you, you need to do something because it's safe. You need to do something because it's social compliance. Okay, and then well, we have production, we have to finish this, and, you know, we're, 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 we're behind and we need to do the right thing. So the way I like to see safety is working together with all the different areas, okay? So the best way I have to visualize is a stool with three legs. And let's go one of the legs, production, the other legs is gonna be quality, and the other legs are gonna be safety. They have to be together. We have to work safe in a way that we can complete the job on the time that is planned. And we have to do it in a way that it's a good product, that the weld is not gonna, it's not gonna break, that the job's gonna be well done. So it has to be a combination of all three. We have to work together. If you're a contractor, if you're a safety professional, if you're a general contractor, you're a subcontractor, doesn't matter what, we need to work together to achieve this goal. Because when we miss one of them, it falls down. And with that, I'm gonna leave you, okay? We have now any other questions that you guys have. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. I appreciate that. I apologize about the uh, glitches and phone calls, but- it, it's, li it's live, man. It's, it's, it's live. live. It's live. Hey, right. if, you, if you folks have uh, questions online, please go ahead and send them to us. And uh, luckily we have our live studio audience. If you guys have questions, please raise your hands and ask Mel. A question for you has nothing to do with welding but torch cutting. A lot of guys think that they don't need to protect the PPE for that. Um, especially, they, especially, they can get absolutely, ab well. absolutely. So, some old, some old, 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 old school guys they say, I know I don't need it for the torch. I don't need it. You still need your face, at least your face shield, okay, a dark face shield to protect you from that, okay. Mm -hmm. You're gonna, you're gonna get flash burn anyway, okay. Uh, for all my welds and everything. I use the, the face shield and for any other grinding, same thing, okay? And 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 the and the eyeglasses, the, the safety glasses as well. Okay, so I have a welder once I had to I had to fire because we train him. And say, no, I have my welding helmet, I don't need safety glasses. I don't care, it's a personal rule that we have here in the company. You use safety glasses on the on the your 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 shield all the time. Yes, sir. Yeah, and just to, to back that up, I've had that battle a lot. I came in straight to welding. They think they're protected, but the problem is when they raise up the hood, the slag will pop and it catches them in the eye and burn. I have, and I have, I have uh, not long ago, I have a guy that was working probably 140 something feet up in, the, in, a, in an area leaf and he was grinding something and he finished grinding, okay? And he lived, the, he had the, the glasses still, thank God. He lived the, the, the face shield and the wind just broke the debris and hit it in the side when, and I had to take it to the clinic, okay? So yes, it's, it's important. Sometimes, again, re-education. And part of the training, you know, when you talk to, to the people and say, okay, this is what you need to do, this is how you need to do it. It's always good to have the feedback from the guys, okay? So what, what is the reason you don't wanna use it, okay? Now because it's too tight, with it. let me find a better one for you. Let's try to see something that works for you, but you cannot still, you cannot use it. If you cannot use it, you cannot work it basically. You know, that's what it is. Okay, because we have, and we have to be a standard with everybody. So, uh, go a little above and beyond and they use spottles on the front of the uh, They use what, I'm sorry? Spottles. So, so that nothing spottles. will get to like their yeah. fiber. Yeah. 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 Right now, one of the problems I have at the beginning of this year, you know, we have this uh, 
safety glasses with a little foam to protect, you know. But yeah, be hard. between the in 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 hot weather, it's, it's hard, you know, because they fall. And with the mask, it was even worse. So I cannot see anything. They just take them off, you know. So it was it was something you had to play with, you know, how you're gonna have to protect yourself with the with the mask and saying, the glasses. You gotta work together. You can't make one safety yeah. protection create another safety issue. Exactly, exactly. You know, that's what I say is like uh that's why it's so important to coordinate the efforts and get the feedback. Okay, you've been doing this for how, how long, you know? It's like I, I know the rules, but you tell me the experience that you have and how we can work and then we figure something out. Okay. Uh, one of the things I, I, I found on the plant when I started working here is many people in the plant were using and also on the field. They use prescription glasses, okay? So yeah, you know, you can have the over the glasses, safety glasses, but it's uncomfortable. If you have my glasses, safety glasses on top of that, welding them is, is annoying. So we created a program. We, 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 we provide the guys with a program to have prescription safety glasses as well, okay? Or at least size shields. So, is, is how you determine everything, but yeah, come Anything else? Well, I'm sure you've had the experience with the, uh, the inspector foot, because when they you talk about lenses and things like that, if you have a crack in that, you can get burned. Yeah. Me, a little, yeah, a little crack, anything. That's what it says, like any damage, anything, you know, any, any little thing. And again, when we go to, that happened most in my personal experience with, with all school, you know, oh, it's okay, you know, it's like, is I like I have this helmet for twenty years. Like, well, it's, it's time to get a new one. You can put that in a frame with new one inside home. Yeah, but you need to you need to to get a proper PPE. The helmets in 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 uh, in construction in mining was the same thing. Like, one of one one thing of pride in mining is having as many stickers as you can from vendors. You know, so it's like you need to replace your hard hat. No, 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 no. This is my heart. No, like, how all the stickers? Here, you know which is another thing because you, you use a plastic hard hat on the sun, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna get brittle. And if, if anybody have seen a test on a hard hat with, a, with, a, with stickers, it's gonna crack around the stickers because the, the, what the ticket is, it protects more, but when it's not. Okay, so that's why the fiberglass uh, hard hats are more recommended for, for a few. Any other questions? No. Go ahead. Um, that you see that your presentation about welding screens. When do welding screens come, uh, come into play? Where do you set up a welding station at our office? Uh, does distance substitute the need to use uh, welding screens? Not really, okay, because it, I can see a, a, an arc flash from, from 100 yards away, okay? It's not gonna affect maybe that as much, but I still can see it, okay? Um, in a, construct, in a construction site, it's very hard to put it, especially if you're in an area lift, you cannot put, you cannot, right. exactly. In a plant, yes, it's recommended. Have the space for the booth and have the screens all over, uh, around, except for the entrance, okay? Some, some uh, welding booths are, are created like with four sides and one of them is shorter so they can enter and out. But it also, it would depend what kind of, what kind of uh, material you're processing, you know, when you're gonna lift it out with the hoist, okay? But yeah, as, as much as you can, you know, if you have a welding boot where you're gonna be spe doing specifically something, yeah, it's 100% recommended, okay? In, in our case, in our plan, because we work with great, big, big scale materials, okay? And big beams and everything like that, it's hard sometimes for us to use the screens because you may have a beam that is as long as this, as this uh, uh, room, you know, and you cannot go around, you cannot do anything. But in that case, we have all the welders separated by, you know, more than 30 feet. At least, okay. You say you have a question too? Yeah. Uh, when when welding becomes certified, uh, have you are you a certified welder? No, I'm not. Okay. Do you know then that when the, the, the welders become a certified welder, how much safety is discussed during that certification? None. None. The, 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 the certification is used about the it's welding. Test, that's all. Yeah. All they're, yeah. Getting, all they're getting, all they're getting is. is yeah. yeah, exactly. That's yeah, that's they don't get anything important. because it's all about you know putting two pieces together so they don't break apart. That's basically what it is, you know. And it's penetration, it's conditions, it's heated up, or where all that kind of thing. But yeah, they don't talk about safety it, because it's, it's training, it's certification on welding, not on welding safety. You know. That's part of it. It should. 
I'm assuming that they give some tips on you know using the, the filters because otherwise no but yeah work. but that's what's so that's why it's so important the the, the role of, of the safety and uh, uh, person the competent person the superintendent the foreman to work together you know so if you want to work here we have this I, I understand you're professional you know <clears throat> but you know it's like you can be a NASCAR driver and you know how to select, so like, but you're not working my job site, you're gonna drive five miles per hour and with a seat belt, you know? <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, anything else? <clears throat> Thank you guys very much again for the opportunity. Thank you, Mel. And actually, I want to apologize to Mel for the technical difficulties we had with the clicker earlier today. So thank you very much, Mel. That was an awesome presentation so just to I remind know, I know you, you didn't purpose to see how my hand the, the I wanted to see I wanted to put you to the test <laughs> so man that was a fantastic amount of information you'll be able to see Mel on our YouTube channel um, in a couple of days once we get to editing and posting it up and you'll also have access to the PowerPoint which he used today which was fantastic so and i love the animations man that's good gold star gold star so thank you all very much for joining us online thank you very much to those of you who joined us here today um i want to thank our sponsors and those that help make this possible milwaukee tools kelly cronenberg safe right solutions and the members of our safety committee uh deborah hampton ian schwartz our host today was styles uh jose bobadilla Mark Leon, Enrique Sequeira, and Brian Cardona. Thank you all very much. Just a reminder, golf tournament, October 29th. If you want to play, hurry up and register. Um, and that's it. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I appreciate it.